to practice the prophetic that it is springtime. Yeah. Hallelujah. I think, I think the strongest wind in the United States of America is at the breezeway of the hotel that I stay at. When I walk outside, I feel like I'm gonna, about to fly over. I start singing that old hymn. I'll fly, and it's literal, I'm flying away. It's not singing to God. I'm flying through the, through the, through the plains of North Dakota. In Jesus' name. How many would you agree that we got the sun out, now we need the temperature to rise? Amen. Amen. Calling things as though they were not as though they are. Uh, Pastor Brady said the other day, let's pray for the farmers. We've been, I've been watching tractors brought all around this place and they're not sinking. Amen? Amen. So that's good for, for North Dakota. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's been really, really good to be here in, in Tioga. I'm telling you, I felt on the front row last night. Pastor Brady's been telling me this for a couple of years, but last night, I really felt the Lord speak to me and say that it's time for Tioga. I, I felt like the Lord spoke to me. It's time for the old patch in Jesus' name. It really is. You know, um, let me share this before I preach. Uh, Elijah was by the brook, and God spoke to him to go there. Uh, and he was fed by the ravens, and he was watered by a brook in the famine land. And where everybody else was having trouble getting water and getting nourishment, Elijah, by the hand of God, was taken care of and provided for. And then God spoke to him to leave. The brook began to dry up. Now, many good Christians, and especially Pentecostals, we live at the campground of what God said. And oftentimes we live in what God used to do instead of what God is saying to do. We'll get stuck. A, a good Pentecostal today would have, would have stepped over the brook and began to command it to produce water again. They would have began to pray for the ravens to continue to come. They would have quoted God's word and how he said for us to be in that specific spot. But there's a big difference in, in doing what God said and listening to what he's saying. Amen. The Bible says a lot of things. And I believe for this season in this area of North Dakota, I believe God is saying prophetically and profoundly, and he's speaking this over this region. The harvest is white, but the laborers are few. And it's time that we begin to harvest. It's time. Somebody needs to say amen to that. Or I'll add 15 minutes to the message. I'm telling you right now, that was a place to say amen. That God is saying to your community that the harvest is white. Amen. Amen. That was fake. I'm adding 15 minutes to the message. Yeah. That, didn't, that wasn't really the 30 minutes. <laughs> the discernment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share... I just feel led tonight just to share my story. I, I, I've prayed about it. I've gone all around the bush on it. And, and I'm just going to do that. You know, guys, how many of you know that you don't have to have your suit just right and your tie just right and read from the King James Version of the Bible for God to hear your prayer? How many of you know you see the wrong people going the wrong way and God's still hearing everything that you say to them? I, I wasn't always saved. I was a drug addict bound by hell, death, and the grave. And... Um, just one night I was doing a drug called LSD. Now LSD is not approved by the FDA, the Food and, Food and Drug Administration. And if you've ever done LSD, don't raise your hand, but uh, I was taking, I took a little bit too much of it this particular night and I was having a bad uh, hallucination and uh, one of the chemicals they put in strychnine is not good for human consumption either. It's, uh, it's called strychnine. And, and, and strychnine is rat poison, and uh, it kills rats uh, quicker than it kills humans. Let me say it like that. And if you've ever found a rat after they've taken strychnine, you find them dead, curled up in a fetal position. And I was in my friend's car, it was about 11 o'clock midnight, and I was literally curling up in a fetal position. My back was killing me, and I told her to take me home, and I, and I got home, I was still a teenager, I was living with my parents, and... I got home and I turned it to TBN. How many of you know that's a wild combination, LSD and TBN at the same time? There was pink hair on the platform and it had nothing to do with the drugs. 
And I was watching this and there was a man by the name of Jeff Finholt that was preaching. He was the ex-lead singer for the group Ozzy Osbourne started Black Sabbath. And the first thing that he said, he looked into the camera, he pointed his finger into it, and he said, there's some young people watching this program right now and you're hooked on drugs. He said, not only are you hooked on drugs, but you're in a deep, deep, dark cave of drug addiction. He said, but Jesus Christ is in the cave with you, and Jesus is going to bring you out of the cave. And when he does, you're going to preach the gospel around the United States of America. And when that man said that, the power of God hit me in that lazy boy chair, and I was instantaneously, in a moment, sobered off of LSD. Now that just doesn't happen. You don't instantaneously sober up off of LSD. And I began to weep. I'd love to say I watched heaven open up and angels come out of the sky and saw a bright light. God began to speak to me, but that's not what happened. But God began to work in my life. And I, would, I couldn't go to parties the same way any longer. I would go to a party, and I was a drug dealer, and I was still a drug addict and a drunk. And I'd look at my friends around 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'd say something like this. One day real soon, uh, I'm going to travel the United States of America and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And they look at me like I'd smoke too many cocoa puffs. You know, they think, this guy's crazy. He's crack addicts. They don't preach the gospel around the United States. United States of America. He drank too much and he smoked too much dope and he's lost it. But how many of you know you can say things even though they're not as though they were? How many of you know that God confounds the wisdom of the wise with foolish things? And I was prophetically shaping the destiny of my life and I didn't even really have a relationship with God yet. And the second thing I'd do is every night before I'd go to bed, I'd ask God to get me in church. Every night, I'd say, God, get me into church because I knew if I ever got to church, I'd have a shot at the Almighty God touching my life and changing everything. I understood down in my soul that if God ever touched me, if He ever released His power on me, that it could change everything in my life. I knew in one moment I could be changed. I'd never read Jacob. I'd never read the story of uh, Enoch. I'd never read I never read the Bible, but I believed in my heart that one touch from God could change everything. And one night I was in Gold Shores, Alabama, and I gave an obscene hand gesture to what appeared to be an undercover police officer, and it wasn't that Alabama was number one at that time in the rankings. And uh, I got pulled over, they pulled us over, and I got out of the car with a beer bottle, and that's not the most... Uh, wise thing you can do to an undercover police officer. And I raised it up and I was waiting for him to step out of the car and I wasn't going to offer him a beer. I was going to smack him over the head with it. And about that time, all of the police in Gold Shores, Alabama manifested out of nowhere. It was like, man, they were like Philip the Evangelist. Uh, they're not there one minute, the next minute they are. And, uh, and, uh, and I went straight to jail. And they wrote a song about me not too long after that. And it goes something like this. I fought the law. And the law. You dirty sinners listening to secular music. I busted you all. Y'all were listening to the song. And I'll fly away. And, and I, went, I, went to, I went straight to jail, and I was in and out of jail over and over and over again. And uh, the last time I got out of jail, the judge looked at me, and he said, You know, son, this is what you got to do. I mean, I had to go to AA, NA. I think I had to start selling Amway for the man. I mean, I can't remember every way in A he made me go to. And then he said, and by the way, you've got to go to church every Sunday and get the bulletin signed by the pastor. And if you don't, I'm going to put you in jail for a year. How many of you know God answers prayer in mysterious ways? How many of you know Joe Bowden had fresh motivation to go to church? I want to tell you something. That's the grace of God. The grace of God isn't some euphoric, mystical force to allow you to live in sin in any way you want to live. The grace of God is when you weren't looking for God, He was looking for you. Are you with me tonight? And so I began to go to church. My church had church on Sunday night. It was a that's a breakthrough thought today. I mean, this was a technology of the fifties. Sunday night services and. I would go to church, and my church was pretty country, Pastor Jeremy. You could smell the hogs when you walked into church. 
uh, because they were feeding about that time. And, and if it was a really good service, you just smell it the whole way through. And, and, uh, and it, was, it was just country. And that's a wild conversation you got to have with a pastor. Hello, my name is Joe Oden, and I'd like to have a few minutes with you after the service. You know, famous last words to the pastor. They don't know what you're going to say. Is this guy cuckoo? What's he want to talk about? I've never met him before. And so we go to the back, and I said, yeah, my name is Joe Oden, and I'm a drug addict. I've been a drug dealer in the community, and, and I'm so bad that the judge said jail doesn't work on people like me, and he said, the only thing that's going to fix me is God. And he sent me to church, and you're the lucky candidate. I've chosen yours to come to. And I got this bulletin right here that you made, and I need you to fill this out for me inside it and say that I was in church. And I need you to do that for me every week. I'm going to be really faithful. I'll come to church more than some of the deacons, Pastor, because I'm court ordered by the law to go, and I'll go to jail. And, uh, and if you don't sign my bulletin, I'm going to blow your car up when you preach it. <laughs> I didn't say the last part. And, he signed my bulletin every week, and I'd go to church, excuse me, I'd go to court with a stack of bulletins about that thing. You know, the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, the 28th, and the judge would look through them. And one night I walked into church, and there was something different in the atmosphere. It wasn't the same as it was the week before. I didn't know how to describe it. I didn't know how to identify it. I didn't know Christianese. I didn't know how to say the Spirit of God is manifesting Himself in power and in great might and extreme force. I didn't know how to talk like that. I just knew something was different in the atmosphere. And I hadn't taken any LSD that particular day and I was having open-eyed visions of the things of God. Now, I wasn't a wild, charismatic. I was a drug dealer and I was a drug addict. And I was bound by those things of, uh, uh, on the inside. And, and that particular night as the preacher was preaching, I was looking up to heaven and seeing God. Amen. And, then, and, and then the preacher uh, gave an altar call and he said, you've got to come to Christ. You need to repent of your sins. You need to leave your old way of life. You need to turn from your immorality and your wickedness and your addiction and, and all these things. And I remember I jumped up and I ran to the altar as fast as I could and I got down on my knees as I knelt down, before I put my knee to the ground, I was bound by death. I was bound by sin. I was bound by the grave. I was bound by the devil. And by the time I stood up off of my knees, I was washed in the blood of Christ. I had been set free and I was made clean. I was captive and now I was liberated. I was shackled and now I was free. I was bound in a prison cell and now I was able to walk out and see the world through Jesus Christ like I've never seen before. And I was standing there and I was feeling free on the inside and the pastor walked over to me. The guest minister from the Brownsville Revival walked over to where I was and he said, son, what do you need from God? I didn't know what to say. I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal church and I looked up to him and I said, sir, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand the theological ramifications behind my request and he looked at me and he said, okay. And he put his hand on my head and this is just my story. And I fell to the ground. Now, that had never happened to me before. I didn't believe in it. I did not believe in it. I didn't care if it happened to me really. But I fell to the ground and I remember thinking, I looked up to God and I had a thought, Lord, that was like I smoked a good joint. <laughs> Very profound thought. And see, God wasn't tripping out that I said that because he was glad the sinner that was bound by the devil had now been sanctified and set free. You see, we want people to walk like us and talk like us and sing like us and we want them to do it all. And they've never been to church. They're in the oil field right now. They don't know God. They don't know what we believe. They don't know the freedom that we have. And we want them to walk like us and talk like us and think like us. And they're not even, before you can clean a fish, you got to catch a fish. That's right. That's, that's the kind of people that Jesus wants to put in this church. He wants to put people that are bound by the devil. He wants, to, he wants people to come in with alcohol on their breath. He wants people to come in with marijuana in their pocket. He wants people to come in bound by crystal meth, amphetamine addiction, and pornography, and sexual immorality. That's the kind of people 
that Jesus came to save. The Bible doesn't say he came for the ones that had a physician. It says he came for those that didn't have a physician. He came to seek you and to save that which is lost. And maybe you're sitting there and you say, well, I was never in that lifestyle. Thank God you never were because God spared you. And if his grace didn't spare you, you'd be there. Are you with me tonight? Well, that's who God's after. Sometimes we want our church pretty and nice and everything to be good and we don't want any disruptions. But God likes disruptions because people that aren't saved, they're not all cleaned up. They don't have it all together. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to take broken lives and put them back together again. We're called to take the Humpty Dumpties and put them back together. So I got up off of the step. We had these old altars that ran across the front of the church, and I didn't know it. it looked like somebody got on a horse in Montana. I sat on it just like this. <clears throat> People were getting hit by the power everywhere. I looked up to God and I said something like this. Lord, this isn't like the regular stuff. This is like the stuff from Columbia. I was getting high. Some of you are looking at me kind of dignified right now. I got it. You were from Arkansas. <laughs> With President Clinton, and you didn't inhale. I inhaled, I knew what it felt like. You see, God wasn't upset that I was saying it felt like a Colombian joint. He was happy that I was once a sinner, and now I'm saved. Actually, there was a great celebration going on in heaven, and God didn't stop it because of what I said. They were continuing to dance through the whole experience because the boy that was bound by death, the boy that was bound by hell and addiction, was now liberated and filled with the baptism of the fire of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was quite delighted. I remember I looked up to God and I said this. I'll never forget it, Pastor Brady. I looked up to God, saved about 15 minutes. I said, Jesus, if my friends could feel this power that's running through my body right now, they'd get born again. I said, Jesus, my life for the gospel. I remember I walked through the doors that night bound by hell, death, and the grave. I walked out saved, set free, on fire for God called to be an evangelist. I went to work on Friday going to hell. I went to work on Monday telling everybody they were going to hell. Let me tell you something. That wasn't the most effective form of evangelism. Some people liked me before that week. After that week, I began to go down on the popular scale. You see, I go to the Brownsville Revival. Anybody ever get a DVD touched by or have a chance to go to the Brownsville Revival? Just wave at me a few of you in the house and... And if you, I was mentored. I had the chance to go on and be mentored by the late Steve Hill. I was on staff with him, and he was my spiritual father. I was an honorary pallbearer in his funeral, and uh, and 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 that was as I uh, would go and hear him preach. This man could Google it, YouTube the man. That guy could tell you seven thousand four hundred and four different ways in one night of ways you could go to hell for. So my first vocabulary word as a Christian was hell. My second one was Dr. Michael Brown. He would run around the revival. I mean, four or 5,000 people a night. And he'd lay hands on your head like this. And he'd put it on you real good. And he'd yell fire real loud. So that's the way I thought you had to pray for people. The first thing you do is say, you're going to go to hell and fry like bacon and hot grease. Lay hands on them and yell fire as loud as you can. That's how I thought you had to flow. So I'd go to the mall. By myself. I couldn't find anybody to go with me, Pastor Chairman. I've been saved two weeks, and I was evangelizing more than most of the deacons in my church. I got quiet in the Episcopalian house. And so I began to go to the mall, and I'd have the tracks, and I had to look at God stare, and I'd look at people like this. God loves you. And I'm serious. I will send you to hell right now. You know, that's how I looked at it. I was serious. This was the gospel. People had been walking through the mall and I'd step in front of them and this was my line. Hello, my name is Joe Oden. If you died right now, would you go to heaven or hell? Tell me, sir. This guy, he looked at me. He said, sir, he said, I am a Baptist. And I thought, I don't like Baptist. <laughs> you know, God's changed my heart. I love Baptist. I was just foolish. And 
and I thought, it doesn't matter if you're Baptist, Episcopalian, or Methodist, or Lutheran, Assembly of God, Catholic, there's only going to be one line in heaven, and that's people that are washed in the blood. That's right, that's right. So then I began to look for something to bust him on. One of those 7,404 different ways I could tell him he's going to hell for. And so I can't remember if it was a pack of cigarettes or a pouch of red man. It was Alabama, was probably both. And I looked at him, I saw a pack of cigarettes, and I took my bony finger like that, and I stuck it in his face. Don't you like it when people that you've never met in your life step in front of your face, and then they point their finger right at you, and they have the love of God stare, and they say, you're going to go to hell for those cigarettes. He looked at me like I was Looney Tunes. I was Looney Tunes. And then I said, can I pray for you? <laughs> he thought I was going to go pray with Grandma. At the church, at the altar. He didn't know I'm about to slap him on the head and he'll fire his nose. I took that dude out. Jesus was looking over the balcony of heaven going, check the dude out. Man, this is crazy. Gabriel Michael said, this is crazy. We need to stop this guy's ministry. He shouts hell and yells fire. Jesus, they think he's sending them, he's, they're shouting hell at him, and then, then, then he thinks he's calling the fire hell on him. They don't know what's going on, Jesus. Jesus said, no, let's watch him a little longer. This is funny. <laughs> And I didn't read the Bible. Isn't that bad? You know, I'm an evangelist. Didn't read the Bible. I like to pray. And I like to jump. And I like to shout. And I like to dance. But I didn't like to read. So God sent a prophetic guy to my church. And he had a prophetic word for me. Read the Bible. So I said, man, I don't like to read. Where, are we? Where do you start reading? Revelation. The red horse. The pink horse. The green horse. The blue horse. The yellow horse. You know, the beast with eight heads and 15 teeth and 17 eyes and eight tails and, and three horns out of the second horn on the fifth horn. How do you figure that out, man? So I began to read the book of Psalms. A little bit easier to interpret. Psalm 133, where they took oil and they poured it over Aaron's head. It went from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And I thought, God, I can do this. This is a little bit easier to comprehend. So I went and got a big bottle of oil. I don't even see the oil. This, this, this is a little bottle. Amen. I mean, this, 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 this is, this is nothing compared to what I, I got. Everybody say jumbo. jumbo. I got the jumbo size. <laughs> and, and I got the size that you get the turkey ready for on Thanksgiving. Are you with me? I mean, I went and got the big pot of oil. We prayed over it. I mean, I'm biblical. I'm serious. This is the things of God. I'm serious. I want got the big bottle. I'm not going to do it halfway. We prayed over it. It's about midnight. We, I think the bottle was bigger than this, man. I mean, we got a big bottle. And we uncorked it. And I took it and I stuck it up over my friends. I didn't do this touching Lord with oil. I'm like, we got to get the whole deal. <laughs> so I stuck it over my friend's head and it begins to make a noise like this. But do <laughs> I want to tell you something, though. It's extremely important. Because when it goes, that means air is being sucked up into the bottle. And you're about to get another douse. He got about eight badoops. He stuck it up over my head. I got about eight badoops. Badoop. 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 And I'm telling you, it looked like we'd been at a slick pink concert in, in Arkansas or something. We walked in there, we where we go is midnight lure in Walmart. We looked like WWE wrestlers. Hell of stuff dripping all over all us. The security of Walmart said the meth addicts have come back. They were going for the Houston Edson Sulafed. How did call the police? Shut down the pharmacy. The meth addicts are here. And we're walking around like this. I mean, we fit the description. I mean, I hadn't been sober that long anyway. You know? I'm walking around. My eyes are wide open. Yellow stuff dripping off behind us. It looked like our depends had broke on aisle seven. Can't make it up, man. <laughs> This guy walked up to me. We're looking for a victim. We're going to tell somebody they're going to hell before we leave. This guy walks up to me. He said, excuse me, sir. What is that in your hair? Oh, I'm sorry. You don't have any. This face is so pretty. God cleared a spot for another one. Amen. He said, what is that in your hair? 
He said, have you been running? I said, no, sir, I haven't been running as you suppose. I took a couple of P.D. Jane steps back. I said, it's the anointing oil of God, and I've come to preach the gospel. I think we slapped the oil on him. He ran out of Walmart screaming, man. He never went back. He's the CEO of Target. Jesus was looking over the balcony of heaven going, check the two down. Gabriel Michael said, it's time to stop him, Jesus. Just speak the word and we'll go down. They said, Jesus, what's he going to do when he reads about Peter? He's getting close to the Gospels. Remember when Peter took out the sword and cut the guy's ear off? What's he going to do when he reads that? Is he going to go buy a sword and if they don't get saved, is he going to kill him and blame it on you, Jesus? Let's stop him. Jesus said, no, we ain't going to stop him. This is good. Did you set the DVR player? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebuke you, Michael, if you didn't set the DVR on that one. That was great. He said, I like it. They're like, why do you like that guy? Jesus said, because he's available. And you see, people may be able to preach better than you can. They may have a voice to sing better than you. They may be more talented or gifted than you are. But you determine how available you are. You see, God wants you to speak on behalf of Him to mankind. You see, you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You're not just a nice person that works on an oil rig or a farm, or you're just not a, you're not just a nice waitress or someone that works stocking things or driving a truck. You're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And God wants to move, He wants to flow through you. So I went to Bible school. Everybody say amen to that. I got my theology right. Right? Isn't that good? And then I went to Thailand. Two years and a half saved a missionary in Thailand. That was a trip. And I traveled all over the nation, messed with some Buddhists and monks, had a great time doing that. And then I went to England for a while. You know, the redneck from Alabama in Oxford University. It was a glorious flow. I mean, can't you see the harmony there? And then I came back to the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you know that America is not the great gospel enterprise any longer? We need a move of Jesus Christ in America. I would, I would, I would be at a missions conference in a foreign nation and I'd look up and see the flag of America and I'd begin to cry. I say America's too young to die. The founders that founded this great nation, they said one nation under God for liberty and justice for all. We, 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 were, we were birthed in a nation, not like Israel, but in a similar fashion. Our presidents and our Senate got on their face before God and cried out, how do we start it, God? What do we do? They didn't sit down with smart brains and, and master's degrees and figure and plan things out. They got on their knees and they said, Jesus, how do you want us to write this? So what do you want us to do? And I believe that America can come back. If God can change Israel in a day, He can change America in a day. If we serve a God that stopped the sun, He could stop the immorality in America. If we serve a God that, that raised up 300 to win a war against tens of thousands, we serve a God who's not done with this nation in Jesus' name. I, I just got to believe God's not done with America. Anybody ever been to McAllister's? They got one of those in North Dakota? They got two, two of the people from Arkansas raised their hand. <laughs> My, McAllister's is a great sandwich shop. It's glorious. And, and I was in McAllister's waiting on my chicken club sandwich right after I got back from America. And these two young girls, they walked in front of me with them shorty shorts on. Look, looked like they put their clothes in the dryer too long, you know. Everything's exposed, everything's showing. And I'm thinking, Jesus, I'm going to stand up and tell them all they're going to hell. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the Bible, the, the Bible does say that women should dress in a holy and modest way. Amen? Not at the beach in a bikini, running around in their underwear in front of a bunch of lust-filled men. Somebody say amen. amen. 
you know, I've, I've got a beautiful wife, but if she'd have been running around in shorty shorts, I'd have looked the other way because I wanted a modest woman. I didn't want everybody to look and see what was on my wife. I wanted to be the one to see it. Is that okay to say? Modesty. You, young ladies, you don't dress modest. Tim's going to look at you that way. Bob's going to look at you that way. Steve's going to look at you that way. Then you're going to start dating Larry because he was looking at you that way. And Larry's going to look at Molly that way and Sally that way and Judy that way. And about six months later, he's not going to look at you anymore because he's bound by lust. And, and he's going to say, are, are you following me? And, and there's a new invention now. I, I've got to show you this. Many of you have never heard of this in your life. Especially the younger generation. This right here is called a belt. You see that? B E L T. Let me pronounce it for you. Belt. This is designed, young men, to keep your pants up above your underwear line. Crack heels. Nobody wants to see your fruit of balloon underwear on aisle seven. In the house of God, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> that gets a good amen every time. It doesn't matter where I'm at. That gets a greeting. So I said, okay, Lord, I'm not going to tell them all they're going to hell. He said, here's what you can do. He said, you can stand up and ask if there's anybody sick, addicted, or depressed. You tell them you serve Jesus Christ, and I'll set them free. So I said, okay, I'll do that, Jesus. So I'm in a no-charlies restaurant. We need to pray that one of those come here too. And you, you know what that is, don't you, my brother? In the Arkansas, brothers, right there. So, and uh, sitting on Charlie's and it's packed out like a cracker jack box. People everywhere. I mean, the whole place is slammed. And the Lord said, I want you to stand up and preach. I'm like, Jesus, there's a lot of people here. Stand up and preach. Yeah, Mr. Evangelist, full of boldness and fire. So I'm like, I'm not nervous. See, so you just stood up and started preaching. I'm scared to death, man. The Lord won, so I jumped up. How do you start preaching in the middle of a restaurant? Want me to show you? Loud. Hey, my name's Joe, and I've got an announcement to make. Go try that. Everybody looks. They put down their pinto beans, they stop eating tacos, and they're looking at you. And I say, if there's anybody here sick, addicted, or depressed, I serve Jesus Christ, and he'll set you free right now if you let me pray for you. And I sit down, and I did that. And you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> I sat down. Nobody moved. I'm thinking, everybody thinks I'm an idiot. <laughs> Jesus, where are you? Jesus said, I'm right here, I'm going to give you part number two. Come on, how many of you would be fired up for part number two? Part number one was a complete failure. He said, Joe, your waitress is in sexual sin with her boyfriend. When she comes back to your table, rebuke her. <laughs> well, I wasn't laughing. You see, you think that's funny. Let me tell you something. That wasn't funny. You think that was funny. I said, God, how am I going to do this? They didn't, my professor didn't teach me this in homiletics. <laughs> so when she came back to my table, I said, man, what would Jesus Christ say to you if he walked up to you right now? She said, he'd ask me for a glass of sweet tea. <laughs> right then and there, I knew she was going to hell because Jesus rented Dr. Pepper. He doesn't drink sweet tea. <laughs> she never waited on Jesus. And then I said, or I might say you're living in a sexual immoral relationship with your boyfriend. And when I said that, she began to weep. She got down on her knees right in front of her manager, in front of the whole place. She began to repent of her immorality and her sin. She began to turn from darkness to light. She gave her life to Christ. She got right with God. She ended the relationship. I talked to her up to her a year later. Why did God do that? Because I'm a good preacher. No, you don't think I'm a good preacher? Yeah, I'm a good preacher. Yeah, man, because you preach pretty good. No, God didn't do it because I'm a good communicator or charismatic. He did it because I'm available. Amen. And this is the word of, let, let, hear me. This is the word of the Lord for North Dakota. 
it's time for the church to be available. It's time for you to be available. It's time for your house to be available. God's called you to be available. Available. We got a Barnes and Noble. Y'all know what a Barnes and Noble is? Oh, praise God. All right, we're in the flow. I got it back in the river, amen? They got a Barnes and Noble, and uh, I, I like to go to the Barnes and Noble and hang out when I've got it. I travel a lot, so I don't have a lot of extra time. You like my boots? You keep looking at my boots. Those are pretty cool, aren't they? Yeah, you like those, don't you? I like them, too. They need to get shine. And so, so I'm at Barnes and Noble, and uh, they got a great section for Christians to hang out in. It's called the witchcraft section. <laughs> And, and you know why? Because people are oppressed of the devil in the witchcraft section. And so I go to the witchcraft section and pray that God would send me a demon-possessed person. Because I read the scripture. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So I've got a great advantage. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So you're out of your mind. No, I'm out of your mind. And so I'm in the witchcraft section waiting for a witch on a Friday night, just like you guys. Some people like to bowl on Friday night. I like to go witch hunt. And so this guy walks in the middle of the section and he said, he said, uh, he's looking at the books, and I walked over to him, Jonathan really conspicuously, man. I walked over and said, hey, man, what's going on? He doesn't know I'm full of the Holy Ghost, about to lay hands on and bind some devils. He don't know, man. <laughs> And I said, hey, bro, is there any power in books? And he goes, oh, yeah. He gives me this long, drawn-out testimony of an encounter he had with the devil. And when he got finished, I looked at him. I said, there's a lot more power in the name of Jesus and the Holy Ghost than that devil. He didn't say amen. He wanted to fist fight. He balls his fist up. He's a lot bigger than I am. So I hit him in the throat first. I just cocked him. No, I didn't do that. And, and so... So, he, guys, he starts going off on me for about 20 minutes. He's just, he's, he's furious. And I, and I let him finish. And I just said, sir, have you ever felt the power of God? He said, no. I said, would you like to? He said, yeah. Now, to the natural, that didn't look like that was about to happen that way, did it? I, I mean, really. I shared a little bit about this last night. 2 Corinthians 4.18 Do not fix your eyes on what you can see. If I'd have fixed my eyes on what I could see in that instance, I would have fixed my eyes on witchcraft, Satanism, bound by hell. This guy can't be free. The devil has it. But my eyes were fixed on the God that I could not see. Because the God I can't see can change what I can see. So he said, yeah. And so I, I took my hand and I laid it on him. I said, Lord, I pray when he gets back to his truck, the fire of heaven will fall on his life. Uh -huh. I pulled my hand off. He said, how did you know I had a truck? It was like a word of prophetic. I, I didn't even realize what I was saying. I said, I don't know God. His whole countenance changed. He wanted to fight witchcraft, preacher, witchcraft, section, demon guy. <laughs> now he's touched by the power of God. I left. He left. A year later, I'm about to do an outreach. Is it okay if I take my, my jacket? I'm burning up. I know it's a t-shirt, but hallelujah. This is old fields. Amen. I'm going to preach like an old field dude. And so, so I'm, I, I'm about to do an outreach, and my friend says to me, Joe, I was in a church service two months ago. And this dude said, I got to tell everybody how I got saved. He said, I was in Barnes and Noble in the witchcraft section of the bookstore. And this wild eyed crazy guy came over to me and started telling me about Jesus. He said, I was in the rolling. And, but he laid hands on me and prayed for me. And when he left, the fire of God fell on me and I got down on my knees and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. 
power. It is the power of God unto salvation. I want to set you free right now. Your charisma, it's not the power of God unto salvation. Your ability to speak, it's not the power of God unto salvation. Your communication ability, how long you've been saved, what Bible school you've been you've gone to, that's not the power of God unto salvation. God can use a five-year-old that memorizes a couple of scriptures and is not ashamed to speak them out in boldness. He can use it because the Word of God is unchangeable. It's incorruptible. The Word of God is a double-edged sword. It's an incorruptible seed. And when you begin to minister it and when you begin to preach it, it puts a punishing blow on the devil himself because we serve a God that cannot lie. Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, recover his sight to the blind, to bind up the brokenhearted, and to set the oppressed free. You know the difference between people like John G. Lay, Smith Wigglesworth, Evan Roberts, William Seymour, Martin Luther, they believed what the Bible said. And they had faith, not in their ability, not in their communication intellect, but in what God said. And they believed what God said. So when they said it in faith, it happened because they simply believed. It's time for us just to believe. It's time. In Jesus' name. It's time for us just to believe. You know who needs you to believe? The guy that's in the oil field right now that just got off work that's putting cocaine up his nose and drinking his blues away. He needs somebody to believe right now. I want to tell you who, who somebody that I've heard around America in North Dakota, sex slavery is on the rise. Has anybody ever heard that? Am I off kilter right now? There's a lot of hands that are going up right now. I'm telling you, that girl that got kidnapped or that got put in a situation that she she never wanted to get put into that got put into a spot that she never desired she needs somebody to be filled with the spirit of God and speak life into a dead place right now in this city in this state in this region it's time for the church to stand up and to speak up and not to back up until the devil shuts up it's time for Tioga it's time for Lord to call it in Jesus you don't have to be an evangelist you just got to be a Christian there was a day that I wasn't an evangelist and I was a believer and shared the gospel there may be a day where I'm not traveling and I'm older and I'm 97 years old but there's never going to be a day where I don't share Jesus Christ you don't have to be an evangelist or a pastor, an apostle or a prophet, all you got to do is be a believer it's time. You've got to be available in Jesus' name. It's, it's time for Tioga. That's not a nice little whipped up saying. It's time for Tioga in Jesus' name. The harvest field is ripe. What's in your basket? Who have you tried to harvest? We were outside one night witnessing in front of a bar. And this, uh, my buddy was arguing with this guy about Jesus. Pastor Jeremy, I've never argued in anybody into the kingdom. I've never said, no, you're wrong, that's dumb, and I don't think you're right. And let me tell you what, I've never done that. And they were arguing back and forth, and I got tired of listening to it. So I just walked over to him, and I had a simple, profound question that you need 18 years of Bible school to do. I mean, it's, you really do. Man, that is, what are you drinking? Water. That's a big flow right there. <laughs> Like if that lady's drinking coffee, man, she's going to have the heebie-jeebies all night. <laughs> Lift up that cup, man. Come on. That is a cup. <laughs> so I walked over to him. I said, you ever felt the power of God? He said, no. I said, would you like to? He said, yeah. So I took my hand and put it on. I said, Lord, hit him with fire in Jesus' name. Simple prayer in faith, believing the power of God is going to hit this person. He said, I'd like to get saved now. 
boom, arguing about God, one touch. If my friends that are hooked on drugs could feel this power that's running through my body, they'd be born again. Led into Christ. Laid hands on them again, it was flowing. I said, fire again. You know what he did that time? He doubled over like this. And he began to manifest demons. He's throwing up on the sidewalk. He's shaking. I was outside of the first bar that I'd ever gotten drunk in. The first bar that I that I that, that, that of, of just corruption. Now I'm a work of grace standing outside of it, casting out devils. Amen. That was great. Take that devil. And so the bouncer's like from me to the pulpit, he's watching. He's used to throwing out of the people out of the bar. Now he's watching us throw devils out of this guy. People are walking back and forth with their margaritas and Coors Light and beers. And we're casting out devils. It's like on the Bourbon Street area. It's great, man. I love to cast out devils. How about you? Like to cast out devils? I love casting out devils. Because the devil binds the temple of God, which, which was designed to be an expression of love to God. The devil has invaded it, and we've got to kick him out in Jesus' name. I mean, isn't it good to cast out devils before they get to the church? Jesus went out. He went about casting out devils. He wasn't just a nice Christian that didn't use profanity. Right? He moved in past. So we're casting out devils. This guy gets free. I laid hands on him again. And I said, fire a third time. And he went over. He doubled over. And broke home to the shame then. You say, what's that? Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he began to speak in other tongues. It's all throughout the book of Acts. And he, and he starts praying in tongues. I said, have you ever done that before? He said, never in my life. So I thought, man, the fire is flowing. Why pray something different? So I laid hands on him again. I said, fire a fourth time. And the dude just, pow, got hit like that. And when Pearl called on the shame day, I said, have you ever said that before? He said, never in my life. The guy got saved, delivered the devils, and baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues in less than five minutes. Amen. God wants to do more through your life than you've ever known, than you've ever experienced, than you've ever thought of. The Bible says that He wants to do more than you can ask, think, or imagine. God wants to move through you. He's not looking for talent or He wouldn't have picked me. He's not looking for gifting. He wouldn't have picked me. I used to travel around in a beat up Ford Ranger pickup truck with a Coca-Cola can with needle holes on in it, smoking crack cocaine out of it. If God can use me, He can use anybody. If God can touch my life, He can touch anybody's life. If God, if I can be a conduit for God, anybody can be a conduit for God. It's just if you'll be available. Does anybody in here tonight want to be available for God to use? Is anybody here tonight ready to let the river flow? I'm going to share one more story. And this was my warm-up, and then I'm going to preach. <laughs> this, was the, this was the segue to the sermon. That was my last night. I was, in, I was in a Subway restaurant. And there was a Buddhist behind the counter. If I say Buddhist. 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 I said it out of Adam style, didn't you? Buddhist. Buddhist. And, and I had a thought. It's not the will of God for this lady to be a Buddhist. Because the Bible says there's one way to heaven and that's through Jesus. Yeah. I didn't write it. And I'm just a messenger. And so I didn't, I didn't start breaking down the book of Romans. I just said, man, have you ever felt the power of God? She said, no. I said, would you like to? She said, yeah. And I stuck my hand on right in the middle of the restaurant. Everybody's watching. I said, Lord, I pray that you hit her with the fire of the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. Amen. She gives me my sandwich. I'm leaving. Didn't look like anything happened. And I get, I get about four foot from the door. And she started shouting at me. She said, sir, there's something on me. 
She yelled it again. Sir, there's something on me. She said, I don't know what it is. And God is my witness. From me to about the third or fourth row, I yelled, it's Jesus. And when I said the name above Islam, Buddhism, and the devil, she doubled over on the power of God. And she began to hyperventilate and weep. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. Amen. And every tongue will confess. I got to that counter quickly. I said, I'm coming over to the counter. The sandwich making dude said, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> I looked at the sandwich making dude and I said, I don't care what I'm allowed to do or not allowed to do. I'm getting to that Buddhist. And, and he said, you can't. And I said, I will come behind that counter. And he was like, that's against rule number 48B of the Subway Handbook. Chapter 7. The Holy Ghost preacher shall not cast out demons out of the Buddhist. But does anybody want to have any cheese? How many of you know? He got out of the way and I jumped the counter and I laid hands on her. She got delivered of Buddhism. Amen. She got born again and took off her idols. Listen. She'd only been in America for two months. She had been steeped in Buddhism for 20 years. That doesn't just happen. It's got to be an encounter with the fire of the Holy Ghost. That's right. Two months later, I'm, I'm driving from Atlanta. I was doing some ministry there, and I'm leaving Atlanta. And I got a phone call. And she said, Joe, this is Wong Chi. She said, I want you to know something. She said, before I met you, about eight weeks before I met you, she said, I had a dream. And you were in it, preaching me the gospel. Mm -hmm. She said, when you walked into the restaurant that day and started talking to me, she said, I knew it was real. She said, I no longer pray to Buddha, only Jesus. Amen. When I hung up the phone, it's back when we had them antique phones that just flipped and shut. <laughs> Razors. Does anybody remember a razor? It's an old antique like from 05, 06, 07, way back in the day. And I shut the phone and it went click. You know, you shut it and it kind of does that. When it went click, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I wasn't praying. I didn't have hill songs on. I wasn't lifting my hands and, and, and singing in the spirit. The Lord spoke to me and said, Joe, I'm giving people dreams all over America. Amen. He said, I'm doing my job. Mm -hmm. He said, tell the people to do theirs. Yeah. I say that, guys, I say that in humility and in grace and in brokenness. God's done his job. Do you understand the humility of God? The man Jesus, the royalty, stepped out of heaven. He changed forms forever. He put on flesh to live for the rest of his existence. He stepped onto an earth that smelled, that was full of sin, that was full of depravity, that was full of wickedness, to serve and wash the feet of his creation. He died a bloody death, separated from God, and he was raised from the dead. He's done his job. All we got to do is say it. All we got to do is talk about what he did. That's what he's calling you and I to do. He said, Joe, that's not my personality. You're an evangelist. The Bible says for all to do the work of the evangelist. I'm not charismatic like you. All you got to do is memorize the scripture and just say, Nancy, you're doing a great job waiting on our table right now. Let me share something with you. And hold in scripture and let God work. Because it's not about you. It's not about how good you speak. Or communicate or, or how well you know certain things all you got to do you're all you got to do is say it and God will do the rest when you share God's Word it's like you build a cement landing strip for the Holy Spirit to land we've got to give God a landing spot will you give him a landing spot in Tioga Will you give him a landing spot in Minot, in Williston, in this region? 
Would you give him a landing spot in the 42 grill? Would you give him a landing spot as you go to the oil patch? Would you give him a landing spot and come and go? Would you give him a landing spot as you go to eat? Would you give him a landing spot? Would you just say the name Jesus? Would you just, when you're at a restaurant, would you just say, hey, you know what? We're about to pray over our meal. Ma'am, sir, do you need prayer for anything today? That's all you got to do. Amen. Bake some brownies and take them to your neighbor and say, you know, it's been a while since I've talked to you. I couldn't walk outside or I'd freeze. <laughs> Last time I tried to walk over to your house, I got stuck for a month like this. And I baked some brownies for you. And I'd just like to give them to you. It's my mother's recipe. And if there was anything you needed prayer for, I just want you to know that I pray for you every night before I go to bed. I pray that God would bless you and heard your mom had cancer and been praying for her every night. I've been praying a blessing financially over your life and been praying for your kids and just want you to know that I lift you up every day of my life. You know what you just did? You opened up a door the size of Alaska for God to begin to move. You might not ever stand up at a restaurant, preach, but you can find a need in someone's life and begin to meet it. Amen. You can reach out, invite your neighbor over for, for steaks, for hamburgers, something. And, and you, you don't have to open the Bible and get King James on. <laughs> Maybe before you eat, you can say, Sam and Joan, we're believers and we're going to pray for our meal. There was a day I didn't pray. There was a day that I was bound by drugs. I don't know if I've ever shared that story with you, but I, I was bound for seven years by drugs and alcohol. And one day Jesus set me free and I'm so thankful. So we give thanks before our meal. Is there anything that we could pray for you about right now? And you just take a minute. Oh, let me, let me tell you something. All Jesus needs is that much. All he needs is a little spot and he's good at shining. Amen. Open the window. Give him a crack. <clears throat> and he'll shine you. It's time for Tyoga. God didn't care how good you can preach, teach, or sing. He's looking for you to be available. Amen. Available. It's time for you to be. Available. It's time for your family to be. Available. It's time for your church to be. Available. It's time. What's the thing that I've preached tonight? Okay. Available. That's good. Some of you said it's time. Some of you said it's available. It's time to be available for time. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to close with this. There will be two things that will hold you back from being available. One of them is fear. I, I, I just want to say this briefly. Boldness is not the complete absence of fear. I, I want to tell you, I, I don't think a human being will ever be totally absence of fear. It's not allowing it to dictate. I've stepped out in fear, and as I began to speak, boldness comes. Fear melts away. And God steps in. Sometimes we want God to do everything before we do anything. God's saying, you just do something, then I'll do the everything. Amen. The second thing is sin. I want to tell you something, church. I want to tell you something tonight. Tonight's my last night with you. Sin will separate you from God. There is no such thing as little sin. I mean, Pastor Brady, I've been meditating on this lately. Adam and Eve just ate a piece of fruit and God changed everything. Just because they disobeyed. You see, church attendance won't save you. Reading your Bible won't save you. Praying won't save you. I'm asking you, I'm not asking you, have you ever walked to an altar and got down on your knees and repeated a prayer after a pastor? I'm not asking you, have you ever filled out a card? I'm not asking you, 
Were you sprinkled? Were you dipped? Were you submerged and baptized? I'm not asking you, do you like communion? I'm not asking you, have you eaten wafers and taken communion? I'm asking you, the day that you believe you got saved, did everything change in your life? Is there a day you can point to where your mama knew you changed? See, when I got saved, I got the smokes out of my mouth. I was living immoral with a girl, and I broke it off like that. Why? Because immorality would separate me from God. And so I stayed separated from that. I didn't want that because I wanted God. I didn't put alcohol on my lips anymore. Why? Because that would separate me from Jesus Christ. I quit watching dirty movies. I quit watching things that were full of sexual innuendo and homosexuality and profanity and, and the things of the spirit of this age. I got rid of the secular music. You say, Jim, what are you preaching on? Well, listen to me, guys. A lot of the things in music today, artists like Beyonce, Lady Gaga, shake it, hip it, hop it, pop it, drop it, Miley Cyrus, and these, this different music, it's oracles of the enemy to propagate and promote his message. You know, you know, young ladies and young men, you wonder why you can't keep the opposite sex hand off you. No wonder it comes to you because you ser whatever you serenade, you summons. MTV, black entertainment, television, Hispanic hip hop. You summons that. We got to be free. You see, God doesn't want us to see how close we can get to the world without touching it and falling in. He wants us to be separated. That's right. He wants us to be set apart. 